In the 1920s, the Osage tribe were the richest demographic in America. In 1923 alone, the Osage made an estimated $30 million, which in today's money would have been $400 million. After being removed from their lands in Kansas and driven to the barren land of Oklahoma, it was discovered that they had been on a huge oil reserve. White settlers during the oil rush would do anything to take this newfound wealth away from the Native Americans. This was the start of a plot to steal everything that the Osage tribe had built for themselves. This is the true story of the Osage Reign of Terror. On May 21, 1921, a hunter and his son were chasing rabbits when it led them into a ravine. They found the body of a middle-aged woman. When coroners arrived, they found a flask near her and claimed that her death was accidental. She must have drank to the point where she was so drunk, she must have fallen over and just passed away from this. It was just an accident. Locals from around the town came to see if they could identify her, but a woman named Molly Burkhart was worried that this could have been her sister Anna Brown. Molly hadn't seen her sister Anna in days, and the last day that she did see Anna, she was heavily intoxicated and driven home by her on-again, off-again boyfriend, Byron Burkhart. Byron was also Molly's brother-in-law, as Molly was married to a man named Ernest Burkhart. When Molly and her other sister, Rita Smith, went to check to see if this was their sister Anna, it was heartbreakingly revealed that this woman was their missing sister. They were able to identify her based on her gold fillings and her teeth. Molly didn't think that her sister died accidentally. She felt, but also knew, that something more sinister had to have happened. Molly had three sisters, Anna, Rita, and Minnie. Unfortunately, Anna's death was not the first loss that the family has faced. Her sister Minnie, who was healthy her entire life, suddenly caught a mysterious illness that they called the wasting illness. And unfortunately, Minnie passed away from this disease in only a matter of weeks. Minnie had been healthy her entire life and was only in her late 20s to early 30s, and so her sisters grew suspicious that this may have been an incident of poisoning. But who would have been poisoning Minnie and why? And to add to that suspicion, the coroner later recounted his theory of Anna's accidental death when he discovered a bullet hole in the back of her head. Anna wasn't just murdered in cold blood, she was executed, alone, in the middle of the night. The sheriff began an investigation into the Anna Brown murder, but leads and witnesses were sparse. The last day that Molly saw her sister Anna was the morning before she died. Anna arrived at Molly's house drunk, so Molly had Byron Burkhart drive her home. And this is Molly's brother-in-law and Anna's on-again, off-again boyfriend. Investigators interviewed Anna's maid, who said that Byron did drop her off. The maid also said that there was a phone call to the house and Byron answered it when they walked into the door. Switchboard operators confirmed the call, but they also told authorities the call was from someone who lived in the area. The maid then said after hanging up the phone, Byron and Anna went back out. This was the last time Anna would be seen alive. Byron Burkhart then claimed that he dropped Anna off and that was just that, she must have gone out on her own. The leads that they did have didn't pan out. Molly used her estate to hire private investigators who also kept coming up short on leads. During the investigation, two more murders would take place. Two of Sage men named Charles Whitehorn and Henry Rowan were also shot to death. Charles Whitehorn was found in the same ravine that Anna's body had been found and died from a similar gunshot wound. Henry Rowan, one of Molly's cousins, was found in his car on tribal land, shot to death as well. Eventually, all leads for the three recent murders went cold or were never followed up with. Two months later, Molly's mother, Lizzie Q. Kyle, began to fall ill like her daughter Minnie years ago. Unfortunately, Lizzie passed away from the same mysterious illness. On March 10th, 1923, Molly's last surviving sister, Rita, died in a house explosion where she and her servant, Nettie Brookshire, tragically died too. Rita's husband, Bill Smith, was able to be rushed to the hospital nearby, but four days later, he passed away as well. Interestingly, Bill was actually married to Minnie first, the sister who died from the wasting illness. He seemed to have wasted no time mourning the loss of his first wife, as he then cuddled up to his sister, Rita, and they were married a few months after Minnie's death. Bill was a white man who clearly seemed to enjoy the lifestyle that the Osage finances brought. It should also be pointed out that both women were obviously full-blooded Osage who received head rights. We'll talk more about it later in the episode, but head rights are the rights that Osage members receive for having shares of oil. All of these women had oil shares from being an Osage tribe member, and when they passed away, it would go on to their rightful heir. So when Minnie passed away, her head rights would have gone to 
Bill? Anyway, we'll, we'll talk more about them. The next victim of the Osage Reign of Terror was a man named George Bigheart, who happened to be the nephew of the chief of the Osage during that time, a man named James Bigheart, who worked hard for indigenous rights. George Bigheart called his local attorney, William Vaughn, and said that he believed he was being poisoned. Vaughn then rushed Bigheart to the hospital, and within a few hours, Bigheart was pronounced dead. Bigheart also claimed to his lawyer that he had important files and documents regarding the Osage murders, as well as who he believed is poisoning him. After his death, Vaughn, the lawyer, phoned the local sheriff and claimed to have new information regarding the murders. However, when Vaughn got onto a train to arrive back home, he mysteriously vanished from his cabin. He was found 36 hours later, naked and badly mangled. It seemed that those who would get closer to uncovering the murders would die horrifically. But it also seems that those who had more head rights had a higher chance of passing away as well. With Molly now being the last alive in her family, she had inherited quite the wealth. Her parents' head rights, as well as three other head rights from her sisters, including her own. Fearing for the well-being of their people, the Osage tribe reached out to government authorities, who then recruited national investigators to look into the case. Interestingly, this is a case that would birth the Federal Bureau of Investigation, or more commonly known as the FBI. The FBI actually used to be called the BOI, which meant the Bureau of Investigation, but this was one of their first big cases that made the government realize having a federal authority agency is important and crucial. They sent out their agent, Tom White, who began to uncover a sinister murder plot in the Osage land that was rife with corruption and exploitation. Prejudice and colonization are terms that indigenous people of America are all too familiar with, and unfortunately, are still victims of today. In the late 1800s, this was significantly amplified as American lawmakers, who were white men, drove natives out of their native homes in order to secure land out west for the gold and oil rush of the time. The western frontier also hadn't been conquered yet, and it was time for white settlers to make their mark on the land. Many tribes were cruelly taken from their homes, either murdered in droves or forced by lawmen to walk to their new destination where many died and suffered horribly. The American politicians during this time wanted to explore and conquer the rest of this new land and wanted to create more states. They were very wary of adopting more states into the Union, especially those out west, because they were worried that native people and people of other races would have to be appointed to represent their state in Congress or have like more political power. So in an effort to keep the federal American court pure, they would remove Native Americans out of their homeland to make home for the new white settlers. One of the most infamous removals was the Trail of Tears of Death, where in the 1830s the Choctaw tribe were forcibly marched to their new land in Oklahoma. This was from the act by the horribly racist president Andrew Jackson, who was one of the biggest advocates of the Native American Removal Act. Some individuals were placed in chains, they weren't given food or water, and absolutely no help from the government in order to make it to their new homes. Apparently, during one of the removals of another tribe, the Creek tribe, they had lost 3,500 people out of their estimated 15,000 members. The Osage was one of the last tribes to be removed from their home in Kansas to Oklahoma. Luckily, they were able to buy the land themselves that they would be living on. Wisely, a lawyer from the Osage tribe worked into the agreement that the Osage would have rights to the oil that was found on the land there. So the government basically said, this is how much you as a tribe receive for the month, and then the tribe would disperse the finances to each individual member based on how many shares they had. But I'm pretty sure every member could only have one share. There was also a catch to this new act that gave those outside of the Osage tribe murderous motivations. The shares, which were called head rights, were given to full-blooded Osage people, but their share could only be given to an heir when the head right holder was deceased. The heirs of these head rights would be the deceased's immediate legal heirs. They didn't have to be full or half or even any blooded Osage to be an heir to receive these royalties. 
it was just who happened to be deemed legally the next of kin. After this law took effect, many Osage were married to white individuals, especially Osage women who were married to white men. The government, however, felt that the Osage were not financially responsible individuals and deemed them incompetent, so they needed financial guardians to look after their money. This was also a way to stop the Osage from becoming too rich and trying to put finances back into the hands of white men. These guardians were local authorities who happened to be white men as during that time, only white men had the right to vote or run for powerful positions. This then started a trend where the guardians of the Osage's estates would then skew the numbers to try to give themselves higher payouts and someone outright refused to give an Osage person their rightful and legally owned money. There was one story of a guardian hoarding this Osage woman's money and she needed access to her funds in order to pay for medical bills to save her child's life as the child caught a terrible illness. The guardian kept all the funds from her. Even though it was legally her money, he was the only one who had the power to cash the check. Unfortunately, her son died because the man just simply kept telling her no. She couldn't get into any of her accounts. And when Molly wanted to look into her sister Anna's murder, she contacted her estate and wanted to hire private investigators and have them look into Anna's murder. But these investigators who were paid by these financial guardians, they didn't really have any motivation to solve the case. They were like, well, if we don't solve it, we'll keep getting paid. Another man named William Hale, who dubbed himself the King of the Osage Hills, also wanted to help in solving the murders and hired another private investigative team. Hale was one of the richest white men in Pahaska, Oklahoma. He, however, earned his fortune through scamming the Osage tribe. Hale seemed to mostly dabble in insurance fraud, and interestingly, he claimed to be best friends with the victim from earlier, Henry Rowan, the one who was found shot to death in his car. Before Rowan's death, Hale went to put a life insurance policy out on the man. Hale claimed that Rowan owed him substantial money, and that Rowan wanted him to be the beneficiary of his insurance policy in case he couldn't pay off any of his debts. The life insurance policy was set for $25,000. Rowan was then murdered coldly within the next few months. It should also be noted that Hale had also been designated as the guardian for the Big Heart estate. The Big Heart family was the one where James Big Heart is the chief of the Osage at the time, and his nephew, George, claimed that he was being poisoned and then called his lawyer to tell him who was doing it, and they both passed away after that interaction. When the investigator Tom White stepped in, he realized the motivations to kill the Osage right away from understanding how the head right laws worked. The question was still who? Who had received the most amount of money from this murder plot? White traced the Kyle deaths. As it seemed, the Kyles were being systematically targeted for someone to receive the biggest payout. The deaths, as White realized, started with Minnie Smith, who was first married to Bill Smith. When Minnie passed, Bill then received her head rights and remarried Rita Smith, her sister. With Anna Brown's death, who was married to and divorced from a man named Oda Brown, her rights then were able to go back to her mother, Lizzie Q. Kyle. Lizzie received her daughter's head rights after her death, but then when Lizzie died, she had her head rights, her husband's, and now Anna's. Those head rights were then split between her last two surviving daughters, Rita with her husband Bill, and Molly and her husband Ernest Burkhart. With the passing of Rita and Bill Smith, Molly and her husband Ernest then received all the head rights. They received her parents, her sister Minnie, her sister Anna, and now her sister Rita's head rights. This made Molly the richest of the Osage members. White then realized that if Molly died, the shares would go to her husband Ernest Burkhart, who happened to be the nephew of William Hale. William Hale was the only family besides Ernest's children and brother that he had. If Tom White hadn't uncovered the murder plot or those behind it at this moment, Molly and Ernest's entire family would have been killed. The shares would have been inherited by Byron Burkhart, and if he died, the shares would then be passed down to William Hale. This would have made Hale one of the richest men in the nation. When this was discovered, Molly Burkhart suddenly became ill. She had suffered from diabetes all throughout her life. But Molly didn't think that her illness and symptoms were from the diabetes, but instead believed, or rather knew, she was being poisoned. 
Upon investigating, White noticed that every lead and every witness seemed to die when authoritative attention was brought to them. White turned to the outlaws of the time to see if they knew anything or if he could use some leverage to get them to talk as most people in town were closed-lipped about the genocide that was occurring. For example, one person talked and said that a man named Asa Kirby set the bomb off at the Smith house. When trying to trace the man down, they realized that Kirby was killed in a robbery gone wrong. He was tipped off that a shipment of expensive jewelry would happen to be arriving that night. However, the store owner was also tipped off that someone was going to be robbing his store. So the store owner sat in the dark with a loaded shotgun waiting. When Kirby came into the store, he was immediately shot to death. It was revealed that the man who tipped off Kirby was none other than William Hale. But who tipped off the store owner? Also William Hale. Hale was using his power, prestige, and status to systematically wipe out anyone against him or who knew about the plot against the Osage. Hale was able to play both sides in the town, expressing sorrow for the Osage and promising to investigate the murders, but then didn't or wouldn't because he was the one who was orchestrating them. White interviewed an inmate named Blackie Thompson. Blackie Thompson was a failed FBI informant, actually. He was a local criminal who was brought in to work undercover for the FBI to help find leads, and he knew about the criminal underworld, so they took him on as an informant. But then he went on to a giant crime spree where he robbed a bank and killed a cop, landing himself back into prison. But White thought that he would have valuable information, so he transferred Thompson to a jail in the local area. White claims to have not given Thompson a deal or option that he'd have a lesser sentence in order to try to give the man less incentive to lie. Thompson then implicated William Hale as the conspirator of the murder, but also claimed that Ernest Burkhart, Molly's husband, was working with him. White then had Thompson come into the room where Burkhart was being questioned. Thompson admitted to Burkhart that their scheme was over, that he had said everything. Scared and realizing he didn't have any power left, Ernest Burkhart broke down and revealed everything. They did hire Asa Kirby to plant the bomb, and that they also wanted Blackie Thompson to set it off, but he was arrested before he could act in the bombing. William Hale, however, continuously maintained that he was innocent. With limited evidence and witnesses, the investigators still put out a warrant of arrest for Ernest Burkhart and William Hale for the deaths of Bill and Rita Smith. They believed that they would only be able to prosecute or have the best chance with the jury if they went after Hale for the Smith and the Henry Rowan murders. It should also be noted, I think Henry Rowan was the only murder to actually occur on Osage land, and when crimes happen on Native American reservations or Native American land, it is deemed federal land, so federal authority can step in and have the only authority. Investigator Tom White wanted the trial to happen in federal court as he feared that the local jury and government officials would not actually prosecute William Hale because of his power and influence in the area. However, trials did take place in the local Oklahoma area. But what helped the case was Ernest, Molly's husband's, immediate guilty conscience. Ernest admitted that he had helped in the bombing of Rita and Bill Smith's house, and then admitted that his uncle, William Hale, was the one who orchestrated the murders, and even orchestrated his marriage to Molly. Ernest admitted further that they used a man named Henry Grammer as a go-between to hire the criminal Asa Kirby to commit the actual killings. Months after the bombing, Henry Grammer died in a car crash, and Asa Kirby was then tipped to rob a jewelry store by William Hale, which ultimately resulted in his death. One of Hale's ranchers on his farm, John Ramsey, also confessed to killing Henry Rowan, the man found shot to death in his car. Ramsey said that he and Rowan went out together to a bar drinking whiskey and then Ramsey shot him in his car. Ramsey also claims that Hale promised $500 which today would have been $9,000, and a new car if he did the hit job. It was also admitted by Byron Burkhart, Ernest's brother, that he and a criminal named Kelsey Morrison killed Anna Brown. When Byron had taken her home after visiting Molly's house, he did call and have Kelsey Morrison come to Anna's house, where they drove her to the ravine where they ultimately shot and killed her. Although the evidence the authorities had was scarce and mostly circumstantial, the surviving men of the Osage murder conspiracy were all found guilty. William Hale, John Ramsey, and Ernest Burkhart were all sentenced to life. 
Unfortunately, after only serving about 15 to 20 years, the men were paroled and went on to live the rest of their lives. Molly divorced Ernest, as it was discovered that Hale had convinced Ernest to marry Molly for her head rights, and ultimately planning to kill her. Their marriage, their house, and family was a complete scam that was orchestrated by Hale in order to become the wealthiest man in the nation. It's believed that Molly wouldn't have been the last to be murdered, but that Ernest and their children would die for Hale to acquire this fortune. Although Molly was being poisoned before the culprits were being found, luckily she told her priest of her suspicions, who then reached out to authorities. It was found that Molly was being poisoned by her doctors, who were associates of William Hale. Luckily she survived, but unfortunately, she was the last surviving member of her family. After the trials and her divorce, she remarried a man named John Cobb. She lived out the rest of her life on the Osage Reservation, but died of natural causes at the age of 50. She was buried next to her sisters, and her children were the ones who received all of their family's head rights. Despite having solved the case, J. Edgar Hoover, the leader of the FBI agency, felt embarrassed by how the investigation was handled and didn't want to admit that the undercover informants they used committed more crimes than they became informants. Hoover didn't push to maintain records of the case or talk much about it. Even though the case is related to the creation of the FBI, the history of the case has been lost to time. Tom White, the lead investigator, eventually left the bureau and became a prison warden. Funnily enough, he became the warden of the prison that William Hale was sent to. To try to keep the Osage people safe, in 1925, Congress passed a law that only allowed Osage people to inherit head rights, and those who inherited the rights had to have half or more Native American ancestry. This was a way to stop the white people from killing more Native Americans. In 2000, however, the tribe filed a lawsuit to the national government that they were withholding their trust funds and that they were receiving less funds than they were supposed to be receiving. The lawsuit was settled in 2011, with the Osage receiving $380 million, which is the largest settlement a tribe has ever received from the national government. Although Molly and her family received justice for the murders, researchers believe that hundreds of Osage people were murdered during this time. Their murders were never properly investigated or even looked into. Many were poisoned, like Minnie, Lizzie, and eventually Molly, but doctors in the area wrote the deaths off as natural causes. These, obviously, weren't the only murders that Native Americans unjustly faced. It's been estimated that over 50 million Native Americans were victims to European colonization. They didn't just lose their land, as most Americans are taught in school. They lost their families, their heritage, and even their own identities. Although laws have been amended and improved to strengthen Native American quality of life, Native Americans are still unjustly discriminated against. It's important to share their stories, the struggles that colonization has brought upon them, and to stand up against this hate. I have provided some resources below to help become better Native American allies and other Native American educational resources. This story is important to know and to share, and I hope that you all enjoyed today's episode. I enjoyed researching and uncovering the story, as I also didn't know the history of the Osage tribe and the horrors that plagued them. One book that I read that I really enjoy and highly recommend for anyone who wants to look more into this case is the book called Killers of the Flower Moon by David Gran. And a movie written by Martin Scorsese just came out actually featuring Leonardo DiCaprio and Lily Gladstone, who plays Molly Burkhart. I haven't seen the movie, but I'm excited to see the movie. And I'd love to hear everyone's thoughts on the case today, as well as your thoughts on the book and the movie. Bye everyone. I hope you have a great rest of your week.